entitlement issues, would there not? And then the government would have to get more and more involved in uh, attempting to try to uh, fix the social issues that were surfacing because of this, uh, the, for these unethical practices, okay? And the first thing you know, friends, they would have a society like we have today, you see? Remove not the ancient landmark. Now, there's not a lot you and I can do about the society around us, okay? We can't go fix all the problems, but as children of God, we can refuse to compromise our integrity. We can make sure that our word, our name, our commitments are depended upon and trusted and accepted as, as truth. And if that happens, if you and I do that, if we decide that we personally, or unwilling to move the ancient landmark, then that's going to change how things go for us. Might not change the world around us, but here's this. If as many Christians, if all Christians would do this very thing, high standard of integrity, unwilling to compromise to get ahead, then this, this nation would change to a great degree because there's a lot of Christians in this nation. But it, it, and it would go well for our families. The thing about it is in ancient times... Land didn't change hands uh, as often as it does today. We see people buy and sell land all around us, okay? Land in those days was mostly handed down from generation to generation in the same family. So, think about this. If a man compromised his integrity by moving an ancient landmark, in essence, stealing from his neighbor, that stolen land would go to his kids, and then to their kids, and then to their kids from generation to generation. And I want to remind you that Deuteronomy pronounced a curse on anyone who stole land. So in essence, a parent would be passing on a curse to their children, their lack of integrity. In a very similar way, mom and dad, if we're not true to our word, if we're not ethically sound and trustworthy, if we're not moral people, people of integrity, we can be sure that our kids are going to adopt that. And they're going to take that mindset and they're going to take those practices and apply it to their lives. And then their children will take them and apply it to their lives and it will serve them about as well as it did us. And that's not very well. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 verse 1, a good name is rather to be had than great riches. Before I came to Jesus many years ago, my integrity and my ethics were in the tank. It wasn't that I had a low standard, it was that I had no standard at all, folks. I really didn't. But one of the wonderful qualities of salvation is that if we will let Him, God will change our heart and change our practices. I learned a verse, it's one of my favorite verses, I learned it a long time ago, it's in Proverbs 13 and verse 11, and it says this, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. I've learned this to be true in my life, and I'm thankful for that God gave me this verse for many years ago, because I learned that a dollar gained by compromising ethically will soon disappear, it won't last long. But a dollar that might be lost by maintaining our integrity will soon be returned to us by God Himself. And that's a fact, friends. We must walk in integrity. The second trait or quality that you and I must have if we're going to have a good year in 2022 is we must be diligent. What exactly is diligence? Diligence is this. It's applying as much of our energy as we can to accomplish whatever we're trying to accomplish. That's diligence. It's trying hard. It's putting forth our best effort. You see, any person can be diligent. It doesn't matter what your position in life is. It doesn't matter your job, your role, your title. All of that's irrelevant. Diligence is simply applying ourselves to doing our best at whatever we're doing. 
If you're making $7 an hour or $700 an hour, it doesn't make any difference. If you're cleaning a room or building a skyscraper, diligence is not measured by dollars. It's not measured by the importance of the task being done. It's, it just amounts to effort and try. And friends, God knows if we're trying or not. He knows if we're giving our best in life. Colossians 3.23 says this, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. We are children of God. We belong to King Jesus. And what we do and how we do it reflects on His kingdom. If you and I do like the rest of the world and and we take shortcuts and we take the easy route and we always try to go the the path of least resistance and we we do the bare minimum and we do just enough to get by, uh, then we're going to be poor representatives of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 6 says this, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. He's talking about a lazy person. He says, watch the ant. Consider her ways and be wise. The ant has no guide or overseer or ruler. He provideth meat in the summer and gathereth food in the harvest. You know what he's saying here? He said, look at a simple ant. The ant doesn't have anybody watching over them, making them do things. Doesn't have a boss. Doesn't have a clock to punch. Doesn't have any cameras watching him to make sure he's meeting his quota. None of that stuff. An ant just goes to work every day diligently and does what he can to lay in food and so uh, that, that he's provided for in the winter. Just a simple ant. You see, an ant is a self-starter. You and I have to be self-starters. If we're going to get ahead at anything, we have to have motivation to do our best. You say, well, I don't like my job. It doesn't make any difference. The job you have is the job you have, and you and I should have, make every effort to represent the Lord as well as we can on that job until we give, it gives us another job. And here's the deal. If we don't like our job and we apply ourselves and we're diligent, God is very likely to recognize that we don't like what we're doing and give us something we do like. That's the way He works. If you and I are only going to do what we have to do, whatever the boss is demanding or whatever our job description says we have to do or what's it, whatever is, is measured in quantity, if we're, we're just going to get by at best and be average. But we can't expect God to bless that. God's not going to bless a weak effort because it, 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 He doesn't appreciate it. He tells us time and time again in the book of Proverbs to be diligent. If you and I set out every day to apply ourselves in the year 2022, it's going to be a good year. Let me just very quickly give you some benefits the Bible tells us that uh, diligent people will have. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4 says, The hand of the diligent maketh rich. Proverbs 13 verse 4 says, The soul of the diligent shall be made fat, which is uh, uh, synonymous with being prosperous. You see, diligent people prosper. There are a lot of people that are poor in this world because they got what they worked for. There are a lot of people that are wealthy in this world because they got what they worked for. The saying, you get out of it what you put into it, is more than just a saying, friend. It is a truth. You get out of it what you put into it. God blesses diligence. How hard we work is going to be the measure of how many blessings we receive from God. God rewards diligence. It might not be rewarded by man. Your boss might not see it and and reward you for it. The people around you might not see it. The people even at the church, if you're doing diligently something here, might not recognize it. But I promise you, God recognizes it. Sadly, we work in a society and live in a society and we're under a government that rewards and compensates laziness, folks. It's a sad thing. More and more every day. We find that laziness is compensated for. But friends, the gravy train is going to derail one of these days, okay? And sooner or later, they have to run out of other people's money, okay? And quit rewarding laziness. And when that happens, when the train wreck happens, God's people that are diligent are going to be fine. Why? Because God will bless their work. On the other hand, you know what the Bible says in Proverbs 20 and verse 4? The sluggard, lazy person, 
shall beg and harvest and have nothing. Friends, that's not a promise that I want to be claiming when, when, when this country runs the wheels off. And, oh, well, my efforts, uh, my, uh, my, my lack of work is going to leave me with nothing. Diligent people will be satisfied. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 11, He that tilleth the land shall be satisfied with bread. You and I are not going to go hungry if we're diligent. On the other hand, the Bible says in, in 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul says, If any would not work, neither should he eat. Those seem like hard words, but that's the fact. The diligent will also be influential and have favor with those that are around them. Proverbs 22, verse 29 says this. Watch this. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. There's something to the saying, it's not... What you know, it's who you know. You've heard that many times. You know, there's something to that. Because being able to pick up the phone and get something done oftentimes is a result of having been a diligent person and having a good reputation with people. And so people are appreciative, appreciative of you and they're willing to help you when your time of need comes. Let me move to the third and final quality. Obviously, this list is not exhaustive. You and I got to walk with integrity. We've got to walk and apply ourselves with, and, and use diligence. And then thirdly, we must live faithful lives in 2022. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 20 says this, A faithful man shall abound with blessing. Did it say a hit and miss man? No. Did it say just here and there a man or woman? No. It says, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. When I speak of faithfulness, I'm speaking, and when the Bible speaks of faithfulness, it's speaking about commitment, being trustworthy, being reliable, being dependable, being consistent with the things of God. Being able to be counted on. Faithfulness in prayer. Faithfulness to the Word of God. Faithfulness in serving. Faithfulness to church. You see, faithfulness is the very thing that impresses God. You know your good looks are not going to impress God. As handsome as most of you guys are, and as beautiful as you women are, it's not going to impress God. You know your physical strength won't impress God. Your talent, your abilities, your wealth, your fame, your fortune, these things, your uh, 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 inherent gifts, these things aren't going to impress God. They may impress people. But they're not going to impress God. Faithfulness is the very thing that steals the heart of God. Anybody can be faithful. You don't have to be pretty to be faithful. You don't have to be handsome to be faithful. You don't have to be uh, very gifted and tall in stature. You don't have to be strong. You don't have to be smart to be faithful. And you can steal the heart of God by being faithful. The Bible is full of people that God calls our attention to and tells us their success stories. And it's never based on, well, this guy was so intelligent, he did so well. It's never based on, well, this guy was so smart, he got rich. And, and, and here, let me tell you his story. It's always based on this. This guy or this woman or this child was faithful to me, so let me tell you their story. And the Bible, time and time again, does so. Abel. He was killed by his brother. That's not a good thing. But he was approved by God because he was faithful to God's plan for sacrifice. He did it the way God wanted it done. Noah and his family were spared from the flood because Noah was faithful to God. And he was willing to faithfully day after day after day for years and years build an ark as God had instructed him and so when the time came, when everybody else was being judged and wiped out, Noah and his family were able to step on that ark because of their faithfulness. Was it because Noah was a good builder? Was it no, uh, because Noah was a great leader and, and caused his family to do great things and produce this ark? No, I'd simply put, Noah was faithful. Joseph was faithful to God, whether he was at home with his father or whether he was sold as a slave, whether he was held in prison or whether he was second command in Egypt. God devoted 13 chapters of the book of Genesis to tell us Joseph's 
success story because he was faithful. Moses was no great statesman. He was no great charismatic leader. In fact, he, he told God, he said, I don't even talk well. And God said, I'm going to use you because you're faithful. He used uh, Moses to lead Israel out of bondage in, in, uh, in Egypt because he was faithful. Joshua and Caleb were just normal fellows like you and I. But they were selected to be a part of a 12-man reconnaissance mission going into the promised land. But the question is, is who knows the names of those other 10 spies today? No one. They died in the desert because they were unfaithful. Who knows the names of Joshua and Caleb? We all do because they were faithful when they went into the promised land and scattered it out. See, these are just a few of the success stories. We haven't even gotten out of the first three books of the Bible, giving you those. It goes all the way through the Bible, success story after success story. Man, woman, or child who were faithful, and God says, I want to tell you their story. They were faithful. It ends, the last story we find in the book of Revelation, the Apostle John. The Apostle John was given... The revelation, the most brilliant peak, if you will, into heavenly things that any man has ever been able to see until they left this world. Why did God give it to John? Because the Bible says he was faithful. He was, being, he was in exile on the island of Patmos because for preaching the word of God. He was faithful. So you go from all the way from Genesis, from Abel all the way to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, and you find time and time again God saying, let me tell you about my servant so-and-so who was faithful. If God wanted to continue telling success stories about men, women, girls, and boys who were faithful, let me ask you this. Would he be able to include you in those stories? Would he be able to say, this is my servant so-and-so, I, I want to tell you about their faithfulness. I want to tell you how they went to church. <clears throat> I want to tell you how they served silently without any recognition. I want to tell you how they, they witnessed for me at work and at home. I want to tell you how they raised their children in the Word of God. What if God was able to say about you, I want to tell you how devoted they were in prayer. I want to tell you how, the, how, how devoted they were to studying the Word of God and knowing what my Word said and what, knowing what my plan was for their life. Can God say that about you? If God's going to tell your success story, He's not going to tell people how much money you made. He's not going to tell people how talented and handsome or pretty or, or strong you are. He's not going to tell, you, uh, tell people how smart you are. If He's going to tell a story about you, it's going to be because of your faithfulness. Any person can be faithful. It doesn't matter what walk of life you come from. It doesn't matter what your pedigree is. It doesn't matter what your age is or what skin color you have. Any person can be faithful and steal the heart of God. I want to illustrate this point with one last story and then we're done. John Eglin had never preached a sermon in his life. He woke up on a Sunday morning in January in 1850. Snow had covered the town he lived in, Colchester, England. It was buried in a blanket of white, and it was Sunday morning, and, and he asked himself, who would go to church in such weather as this? And then he thought, I'm a deacon. If I don't go, who would go? So he got his hat, and he got his coat, and he got his boots, didn't get in the car. This is 1850. He walked outside and for six miles he walked to his church in the snow. He got there and he was one of only a few who came to church. Only 13 people were present that day. There were 12 members and there were one visitor. Even the pastor didn't make it. He was snowed in. Someone suggested that they go home, but Eglin wouldn't hear that. He said, we've come this far we should have some kind of service. The question came up, well, well uh, who will preach? He'd never preached a sermon in his life, but he said, I'm a deacon, I guess it's left to me. And so he got up there and, and, and he began to preach as well as he knew how, which was not very well, and the sermon only lasted 10 minutes. But towards the end of the sermon, he got an uncharacteristic amount of courage that settled over him. 
And that one visitor that was in the, in the uh, auditorium that day was just a young teenager. Eglin looked at him and he says, Young man, look to Jesus. Look, look, look were his exact words. And that young man did that very thing. He looked to Jesus and got saved that day. And the young man's name was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. If you don't know who Spurgeon is, he became known in the 1800s as the Prince of Preachers. He preached to over 10 million people in his lifetime. He preached to thousands every Sunday in the Metropolitan Tabernacle Church that he pastored for all those years in England. The first mega church. All because of one deacon that woke up and says, I must be faithful. I just gave you three characteristics that are going to help you have a better life and help me have a better life in 2022. Three things. Have integrity, be diligent, and be faithful. Three things that every single person can do. Don't have to have a master's degree to pull this one off. You don't have to have a lot of life experience to do those three things. You don't even have to be talented. It's just making a choice. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be diligent. And I'm going to make, I'm not going to remove the ancient landmark. I want to make ethical decisions. I'm going to walk with integrity. Brother David, if you guys will come. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what? I'm not sure God could write a success story about my life. I try, but, uh, but I don't try as hard as I should. I haven't been faithful. I often talk to you about coming into church. I try to not rant at you about that. But one of the measures of a Christian's faithfulness is to his church, his or her church. Weather's inclement this morning. That's obviously knocked many people out, and I totally understand. I get that, okay? But when we can, we ought to be faithful in 2022 to God's church. We ought to be faithful to his word. We ought to be faithful to prayer. We ought to be faithful to service. I'm going to ask you to stand. Maybe God's spoken to your heart this morning. You say, I want to commit to these three things. I want to start the year off right. You're just two days into this year. It's certainly not too late. Maybe you say, well, I want to commit to all 363 remaining days of 2022 to do these things. These altars are open. If God's spoken to your heart, you come. Nobody's going to be looking around. Just, uh...